1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 12. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without result. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those who are proved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as Father deals with his children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Never before have we had access to so much information. Human knowledge is doubling every 12 hours and 90% of the data uh, in the world today has been generated in the last two years. You have access to a massive amount of information and in amongst all that information, there is a great deal of Christian teaching. For my grandparents' generation, if they wanted to hear someone preach, uh, they would have to attend a service in person and there were only so many churches you could get to. And you go back even further, pre-industrial revolution, when there were no cars, buses or trains, people were even more limited. Most people had to walk to church. So if you wanted to get Christian teaching, you really didn't have that many options. Today, via the internet, you literally have millions of options and some would argue that's a good thing. They might say, well, if your local minister is uninspiring or teaching falsehood, you can go elsewhere, either online or in person. The flip side of the coin is you have access to all this teaching, but much of it is misleading, it's wrong, it's false. So how do we work out what's what? It can be a bewildering minefield, especially for new Christians. Of course, it doesn't help that every well-known Christian is accused of being a false teacher. If you go on YouTube and type whatever name followed by false teacher, you'll bring up videos denouncing their teaching and questioning their faith. And those accusations may or may not be true. And this raises an important question. How can we tell if a Christian teacher is genuine? Well, today's passage helps us to answer that question. Paul is a servant of Christ. And in this passage, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12, he defends his ministry to the Thessalonians. And in so doing, he paints a portrait of a true servant of Christ. This helps us not only because it shows us the kind of person we should be listening to, but also the kind of person we should be because every genuine Christian is a servant of Christ. So why did Paul have to defend his ministry to the Thessalonians? Well, because he was accused of being a false teacher. If they'd had YouTube back then, someone would have made a video about it. And, and yes, if you type Apostle Paul false teacher, uh, someone has made a video about that. Uh, those videos are not worth uh, watching, I hasten to add. So because of these accusations, Paul defended his message, and he did so by reminding the Thessalonians of the shape of his ministry whilst he was with them. And he begins talking about the way uh, that he was treated in Philippi before he came to Thessalonica. In Philippi, Paul 
uh, was subjected to a brutal public beating, made all the worse because he was stripped naked. Uh, the humiliation of that would have been even worse in that culture than it is uh, today in ours. And he was imprisoned, he was put in the stocks, uh, he had a really rough time. His detractors were no doubt saying, look at this weasel, he got caught spreading falsehood in Philippi, he got exactly what he deserved, and then he came here to try his luck with the same old nonsense. If you've ever seen the film Unforgiven, it's a Western with uh, Clint Eastwood, there's a character called English Bob, and he passes himself off as an English gentleman. He makes out that he's this, uh, this chivalrous hero, this good guy. He even travels with his own biographer, when in reality, he's just a, a gunslinger. He's an unscrupulous, uh, opportunistic, um, conniving uh, bounty hunter. And he arrives in this town uh, with unscrupulous motives. He's promptly arrested by the local sheriff. He's beaten up badly and he's driven out of town. And you don't hear anything more about English Bob in the film, but you kind of imagine that he's just gone on to the next place to ply his dishonest trade. And that is how Paul's enemies were trying to portray him as a, a greedy, opportunistic liar. And Paul says, yes, we were treated outrageously in Philippi, but our message is from the Lord. And so we dared to tell you this gospel in the face of strong opposition. In other words, they persevered in the face of adversity. As we heard last week, the opposition in Thessalonica was so strong that Paul and Silas had to flee. They were lucky to escape with their lives. And there may have been some who were questioning is Paul the real deal? After all, he did a runner as soon as things got difficult. And Paul reminded them that he preached the gospel with boldness and persevered in the face of adversity, in this case, violent opposition and threats to his life. The test of a person's character is what it takes to stop them. And Paul wouldn't allow anything to stop him preaching the good news of Jesus. Christ's servants persevere in the face of adversity. Next, Paul talks about his motivation. That is to say, he is motivated by a desire to serve God faithfully. And he says a number of things about this. Uh, verse three, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. And he goes on in verse four, uh, we are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. So a lot of that is about Paul's motivation. But firstly, let's talk about error. And this is a slight exception because someone can have the right motives, but still be in error. Uh, but Paul speaks as someone approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. This task was given to Paul um, by Jesus himself. He appeared to him on the road to Damascus, uh, sorry, Damascus and spoke to him uh, thereafter. Uh, Paul's been given this charge by Christ and Paul is formulating the doctrines of the Christian faith based on his intimate knowledge of the Old Testament, based on the life, the death, the resurrection and the teachings of Jesus. And he's formulating these doctrines by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul was not in error, nor were any of the other New Testament authors. What they wrote is authoritative. Outside of the pages of the New Testament, uh, any teacher or preacher can get it wrong. That's why it's so important for Christians to know the message of the Bible, to read it, study it, um, ask questions, seek understanding. If you've got a good knowledge of the Bible, you've got a much better chance of spotting false teaching. As Anglicans, we also have the creeds, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. We pray them regularly in church. The creeds were formulated by the early church and they remind us of what's most important about the Christian faith. The creeds give us the gospel in distilled form. And they're especially helpful for new Christians who may not have had the opportunity to study the Bible in detail. If you hear teaching that directly contradicts the creeds, it is false teaching. We want to avoid error. The message being preached is important. Does it line up 
with the message of the Bible? Does it help us to understand what we read in the Bible? But we also need to pay attention to the motivation because the motivation will often shape the message. So what are the impure motives that Paul speaks of? Well, uh, there are lots, but I think there are two main ones that he identifies, and that is human praise and greed. So let's start with human praise. Paul says in verse four, we're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. And then in verse six, we were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. We all like to be praised. We like to be respected, well thought of, appreciated, and that's quite natural. In fact, research shows that receiving praise releases dopamine in the brain, which is a feel-good chemical. It's the same chemical that gets released when we fall in love or eat a cupcake. If you post something on Facebook and it gets a like or a comment or multiple likes, that releases dopamine in the brain. Uh, that's why people can get so addicted to social media. Uh, people get addicted to praise. And when a preacher of God's word is addicted to praise, well, that's a dangerous combination. The gospel is the most wonderful news for everyone who receives it with joy and gives their life to Christ. However, for those who are unwilling to turn to Christ, it is an offence. The gospel is an offence. That is why the um, religious people of Jesus' day had him crucified. They were offended. They were angered. A teacher of God's word who is more concerned about what people think of them than what God thinks is likely to present their audience with what I'm going to call gospel light, which isn't really the gospel at all. Kind of like, well, we don't want to talk about sin because that can be kind of awkward. Or uh, better not mention miracles because in this age of scientific enlightenment, people don't really uh, believe in them. Or we better skirt around this passage because it's countercultural and it's difficult to deal with. Um, you, know, you know, avoiding aspects of the gospel is bad enough, but some go even further. They tell people exactly what they want to hear, uh, regardless of whether or not it's true. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And we see this in the church today, uh, those who would tell people, who would tell the culture exactly what it wants to hear. And it comes across in all kinds of ways. For example, you might hear everyone goes to heaven or God doesn't care what you do in your private life uh, so long as you don't hurt anyone. Or becoming a Christian will make all your problems disappear. Or if you give generously to the church, God will repay you in material terms in this life. He'll, he'll reward you with riches. You can hear all of those things preached, but the Bible doesn't say any of those things. Paul was not looking to be praised by people, which is why he got himself into so much trouble. His message was confronting. Many didn't want to hear it. Many were deeply offended and angered by it. Uh, the reality is a lot of people don't want to hear the truth. They don't like the truth. Not even when it's the glorious, wonderful, life-giving truth of the gospel. If a preacher or teacher is motivated by what people think of them, well, they will preach gospel light, which isn't a gospel at all. The un other unhealthy motivation that we're looking at is greed. In Paul's day, there were a lot of philosophers, mystics, self-proclaimed prophets and teachers who were just trying to make money. Their motivation was profit. And Paul alludes to this in verse five. He, he says, uh, you know, we were never, you know, we never use flattery, nor do we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. Uh, we see this today in many forms, but particularly of what you might have heard uh, called the prosperity gospel. The central claim of the prosperity gospel is that you can have everything that God promises now in this life. You can have health, wealth and prosperity. 
not everything these preachers say is bad. For example, do we believe that God heals today? Yes. Do we believe that God wants to provide for our needs? Yes. Do we believe that Jesus offers us fullness of life? Yes. But on the other hand, can Christians expect to be free of every disease, illness, and ailment? No. Um, will Christians always be wealthy? No. Jesus was poor. Uh, the majority of the world's Christians are poor, certainly by our standards. Will Christians always prosper in a worldly sense? No. We are heirs and co-heirs with Christ, but we don't get everything that's coming to us right now in this life. However, it's very lucrative to tell people what they want to hear. You just have to tell them that the more money they give to the church, the more God's going to bless them in financial and material terms. The audacity of these preachers is unbelievable. I remember a story five or six years ago, an American pastor who started a, a fundraising campaign to buy a $65 million private jet. And I think he actually got it. Uh, doing a bit of research for this, I came across uh, one preacher online. He was looking directly at the camera. Underneath him, it said, call now, toll free, operators standing by. There was tinkly music in the background. And here's what he said. And, and I quote him directly. He said, I have a feeling that there's somebody who wants a credit card debt wiped out. That if you'll use your faith as you sow, and sow is a euphemism for giving financially, um, he says that if you use your faith as you sow, as you sow the thousand dollars on a credit card, as you use your faith, God's going to wipe out your credit card indebtedness. Now that is, of course, outrageous, uh, pure charlatan um, preying on very vulnerable people who are in severe debt. It's an extreme example um, often the prosperity gospel is, is more subtle than that. And, and, and it's not a sin to be wealthy. But I'd be very suspicious of any pastor, preacher or teacher who's living in a multi-million dollar ranch and has other properties dotted around the place, flies around in a luxury uh, private jet. Uh, it's very hard to reconcile that with Jesus and the apostles and the way they lived. Uh, Paul may have been accused of being in it for the money, but his lifestyle affirmed the opposite. He was so concerned not to be a burden to this new church in Thessalonica that he worked night and day, uh, and we know that he was a tent maker. That's not to say there's no place for paid ministry in the church. Paul himself received financial help from the Macedonian churches um, when he was engaged in ministry in Corinth. Uh, but on this occasion in Thessalonica, he didn't think that it would be appropriate. Paul is not motivated by greed, money or material gain, nor is he motivated by man's empty praise. His sole motivation is his desire to be a faithful servant of Christ. Finally, there was a relational aspect to Paul's ministry. And uh, we see this in verse seven. He says, instead, we were like young children among you. And uh, that can also translate, we were gentle among you. So we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Paul has tremendous love and affection for the Thessalonians. Like a loving parent, he treats them with great tenderness. Uh, I talked earlier about gospel light. Well, some teachers, some Christians, are so determined not to fall into that category that they go to the opposite extreme. They preach the gospel in such a hard-nosed way that it doesn't sound like good news at all. Kind of accept Jesus or burn in hell, make your choice, I don't care, that kind of thing. Even when, that's being, even when what's being said is technically accurate, it's said in such a loveless way that it just puts people off. If you don't love the person, don't try to share the gospel with them, because if you don't love them, the chances are you don't understand the gospel yourself. We must love people. Paul's love, Paul loved the uh, Thessalonians. He, he says to them in verse 8, he says, Because we love you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. <laughs> 
When Paul shared the gospel, he reasoned, he explained, he exhorted, he encouraged. No doubt he was very direct at times. Paul didn't mince his words, but the Thessalonians could never doubt his love for them. And those that we're sharing our faith with should never be able to doubt the fact that we love them and want the best for them. That should come across in everything we say and do. The advantage um, of the small size of the early uh, first century church is that they, the, the, the people in that church, they knew uh, the teacher, in this case, Paul, and he knew them. So they could gauge where he was coming from. That's much more difficult to do in a larger church and even more so online. Uh, Eugene Peterson, who translated the message translation, uh, he says that he uh, wouldn't want to pastor a church where he couldn't remember everyone's name. He wouldn't want a church to get to that size where he didn't really know everyone and they know him. Uh, but churches do grow. And so the love, care, compassion and gentleness that Paul showed needs to become the cultural norm within the church. The fruits of the Holy Spirit that we were looking at last month, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are not just for individuals. These fruits will abound in any church that sits under the sovereignty of Christ. So it seemed that Paul was accused of being a money-grubbing fraud with suspect motives who would disappear at the first sign of trouble. Nothing could be further than the truth. Paul was a true servant of Christ. He persevered in the face of adversity, he was motivated by a desire to serve Christ faithfully, far from wanting money, prestige and praise. He was willing to work hard and forgo a great many personal comforts. And he genuinely loved those he was ministering to. Uh, those are some of the qualities we look for in Christ's servants. Perseverance, humility, love. And those are some of the qualities that we should aim to develop in our own lives, whether or not we're in public ministry, because we are all, if we belong to Christ, we are Christ's servants. And if we're online, perhaps confused about who we should listen to, those are the qualities that we should look for in teachers. Not always easy to discern at a distance, which is why it's so important to be plugged in to a local church. So it's not just about what a person is saying, but how they're saying it and what seems to be uh, their motivation. And we see all of that in Paul's defence uh, of his ministry to the Thessalonians.